I think it's easier to master uh, molecular biology if you understand why uh, it happened or what problem it solves. Uh, so this is where we left off. Um, in order for life to happen, life needs to have functional proteins. Each one of those proteins is either important to the structure of the cell or it's one of the little robots that is allowing the cell to do what the cell needs to do to be alive and, and to create an entire living you. And for proteins to function, they have to have the proper conformation, the proper shape. And if a protein's gonna have the right conformation, they need to have the right sequence of amino acids since it is the order of the amino acids that dictates the way they interact with each other, that dictates the shape or conformation of the proteins. Now the cells, they need to have the instructions for that amino acid sequence. Um, they, need, they, need, they need to know, someone needs to have those instructions. And your body needs to make copies of those instructions trillions of times, even in just your lifetime. But it's more than that. I mean, considering that, that your parents handed the instructions to you and their parents handed them down to them and et cetera, right? Um, any mistakes in copying the instructions is a mutation, and those mutations could cause the proteins not to work. And if the proteins don't work right, your cells die or turn into cancer cells, and then maybe you die. So this is the problem that this system we're studying called molecular biology needs to solve. So how did it solve it? Allow me to provide an analogy. And the analogy is a simple one. Let's look at this image over here on the left of your screen that has a piece of ancient pottery and the little piece of um, mold that was used to make the pottery. Of course, it was a whole big piece of pottery, I assume, at some point. Now, you'll notice that these two sides, they fit together. Well, durr, I mean, that's the way a mold works, right? You put wet clay into the mold, and then when you pull them apart, magic, they are complements of each other. Let me write down that word, complements, because the word complement is going to be important. Complement. It's complement with an E there, not an I, because it's not like, hey, nice DNA. It's complement. Complement means they fit or they match or they go together. The two things, the piece of pottery and the mold, they're not identical. They're not copies of each other, but they're not random. They fit together. So if we look over here, everywhere that we see like a straight ridge over on the mold, we see a straight groove, right? And everywhere on the pot, we see a curvy ridge. Over here, we see a curvy groove. They fit together. You have already learned that DNA its two strands fit together by hydrogen bonds between the uh, nitrogenous bases. And now I'm going to add to that, that the left strand here and the right strand here, they, not, they don't just fit together, but they are complements of each other in the same way that the piece of pottery and the mold for the pottery fit together. So everywhere there's a round ridge on the opposite side, there's a round groove. And on one side, if there's a square ridge on the other side, there is a square groove. They fit together. What this means is, that if I wanted to, let's say this little thing that you see over here on the left, let's imagine I was going to be able to make um, lots of money by selling them online, right? And if I could sell them online, I could make a lot of money. So I want to make 10,000 of them. If I wanted to make 10,000 of them, should I get a piece of clay and start carving it to make it look like this? Is that a good plan? 
Well, first of all, I'm very likely to make a mistake if I do that. But even if I didn't make a mistake, why would I want to work that hard? The truth is, if I wanted to make this, a copy of that, all I need to do is to take this thing over here on the left, the piece of pottery, I just need to make take this and put some wet clay on it and let the wet clay dry. And then when it's done, boom, I would have made a perfect copy of this thing over here on the right. That's the strategy life used. And you know, when you look at it from our point of view, knowing the system, it seems brilliant. But the truth is it took until the late 50s, early 60s before we figured this thing out. As a matter of fact, even when I was in college in the late 1970s, they did not teach this to biology majors yet. It wasn't until the late 1970s, early 1980s, that teaching molecular biology became a normal part of a biology major's education. And that wasn't that wasn't that long ago. Okay, it was a long time ago. But it took us forever to figure out, but it's it solves so many problems. So keep that in mind as we're studying this. Remember that nucleic acids are our genetic material. DNA is in the form of this double helix, and RNA is usually single-stranded, right? That DNA is made out of, and RNA are both made out of nucleotides, and that every nucleotide has got a phosphate, a sugar, and a base. The phosphates are all the same. The sugar for DNA is deoxyribose, and the bases for DNA are G, A, T, and C. I had to watch that movie Gattaca and see if it still holds up, right? So deoxyribonucleic acid, D, N, A, deoxyribonucleic acid. Remember, it's the phosphate, didn't mean to do that, the phosphate and the sugar, phosphate sugar, that are tied together by covalent bonds that make up the backbone of the DNA. Let's go back here. This is phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar. And the nitrogenous bases are hanging off towards the other strand of DNA in the double helix. The nitrogenous bases for DNA are guanine, cytothymine, adenine, sorry, I always think of them, guanine, adenine, thymosine, cytosine, because I think Gattaca, right? Now, when it comes to the nitrogenous bases that make up DNA, uh, two of them are large, guanine and the adenine, and two of them are small, the thymine and the cytosine. And that's another reason why I like Gattaca, because with Gattaca, the G and the A, they are the larger of the nitrogenous bases, and the T and the C are the smaller of the nitrogenous bases. The larger nitrogenous bases are called purines, and the smaller ones are called pyrimidines, pyrimidines. And uh, the way I remember this is the larger word is the smaller base and the smaller word is the larger base, okay? Gattaca. Now, this uh, begins to explain why the system of molecular biology is um, foolproof. In molecular biology, there are only four bases and they are as, as different from each other from the point of view of the enzymes that are going to be building this molecule called DNA. These four bases are as different from each other as black, white, red, yellow are to you and I. Let's make them even more different than that. Let's make the pieces, let's make pieces of cardboard, black, white, red, yellow, and the black and white fit together, but the white pieces big and the black piece is little and they're also shaped differently, okay? There, and there are only four things. Now, uh, the structure of DNA. Deoxyribose bonds with a phosphate group 
to form this long chain, which is the backbone of the molecule and makes up the strand, right? Phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, making up the strand. And the nitrogenous bases come out towards the side. Oops, comes out towards the side. Let's take one more step and talk about the binding rules of complementarity. Hmm. I think I've got that in a, uh, in a slide, but let's just do it here. The binding rules, or they're also, they're also called the rules of complementarity. Remember I told you, plan ahead. Remember I told you that the two strands of DNA were complementary to each other, that they fit together the way the piece of pottery and the mold fit together. And by that fitting together, I mean the way these two bases, nitrogenous bases come together, there's only one way that they fit. When the cytosine binds to the guanine and the thymine bonds to the adenine, ready? Those are the binding rules of complementarity. If in a lab, uh, someone asks you about the binding rules or the rules of complementarity, they mean the cytosine always bonds with the guanine and the thymine always bonds with the adenine. Okay. Then the two strains of DNA get twisted around. Now, here we can see how they fit. Two things. Remember that the guanine and the adenine, the first two letters of Gattaca, the guanine and the adenine, they're big, they're the purines, they're bigger. And the thymine and the cytosine, they're smaller. So the first thing that makes it easy to make the pairs as the enzyme is making the pairs is that they recognize that between the strands of the DNA, right? This is all phosphate glucose, phosphate glucose, right? Between these strands, there needs to be one big nitrogenous base and one little one, because that's the only way that they're going to fit together. If you try to put two big ones in there, two big ones would cause a little bulge here, so that wouldn't work. If you tried to put two little ones in, they wouldn't be able to reach across to each other, so that wouldn't work. So the system will always be one big, uh, nucleotide nitrogenous base, one purine, and one little one, one pyrimidine. So that's number one. Now, uh, the second thing is that you can't put together a guanine, which is big, with a thymine, which is small, because the, uh, they have a different number of hydrogen bonds that they will form. I want you to notice that the guanine and the cytosine they fit together with three, with three hydrogen bonds, whereas the thymine and the adenine, they only fit together with two hydrogen bonds. So from the point of view of the enzyme that's going to be building this thing called DNA, it is very difficult for the enzyme to make a mistake. If it's not clear yet, give me a little more time, okay? All right, so here you are. You are going to be the enzyme that is going to be making a strand of DNA. Oh, I've run out of time. We will start here at the beginning of the next lecture.